Okay, let's begin. Last time I showed you how to make a sequence program, and today I'm going to show you how to make a state machine program. Remember, the key difference between the two, both have steps, or in this case we'll call them states instead. But the key difference is that a state machine can go from any state to any other state without going through any particular sequence of states. That makes it more powerful and more flexible. I don't have a really good example to apply this to, and it actually takes quite a bit of time to create a state machine even for the simplest of tasks. But the nice thing about a state machine is that if you design the state transition diagram to do what you want the machine to do, and then you program it and transfer that design into a program, the program will do exactly what you've designed it to do, which can be a good and a bad thing. But it can be a bad thing if you haven't designed it properly. <clears throat> but remember I said that the, the key thing about state machines is to start off with a state transition diagram. So we'll start off in the get box state. So this is, this is where the machine will spend a lot of time with its output set at a certain, uh, you know, certain, in a certain way and waiting for inputs to tell it what other state to go to. So we can think of this as the time when the box is coming down the conveyor. Does that make sense? So what should the machine, what should the outputs look like to get the box to come down the conveyor while we're trying to get a box? Well, last time we talked about this and we said that the motor should be on and the valve should be off. All right, so it's pretty simple. And the way you need to think about the state trans transition diagram is that the PLC will spend a lot of time in this, this mode, if you will, waiting for something to get it out of that mode into another mode. Okay. <clears throat> now what mode might it go to next? Well, we might like to transition, that's what that arrow is called, it's a transition. We might like to transition to the fill box state where we turn the motor off and we turn the valve on. Now, how would we know that we could transition from getting a box to filling a box? What input would become true or false? Or set of inputs would become true or false that indicate that we should fill the box? What do you think? The proximity sensor? Proximity sensor, exactly. When prox equals one, when it turns on, we will go to the fill box state. Now you might say, well, wouldn't you also like to have level equals zero. In other words, have a box in place that is empty. Well, here's the thing. The more conditions you put on the transitions, the more work it is to program these machines. So you want to use the minimum number of conditions possible. And if I'm careful in the way I design the state transition diagram, I can reduce the number of inputs required for each transition. Let me show you what I mean. The next thing, of course, that will happen is we will go over to a, um, sorry, that's the wrong way. I'm trying to copy the diagram I've already got so I don't have to recreate it on Blackboard. Uh, the next thing we would do is go to a state that is the, let's call it the full box state. Okay. The idea behind the full box is that we've, we had a box that needed to be filled, but now the box is full. If we have a box that's full, we need to move it out of the way. So what should the motor be, on or off? Conveyor motor. On. on. Do we want the valve on? No. No, we want the valve off. So understand that each state is associated with a set of outputs. Now there can be more outputs than this. It doesn't have to just be the valve and the motor. But what I'm doing right now is I'm concentrating on the, the heart of the process. Okay. All right. Now, what does it take to go from fill box to full box? What input would be triggered that would go true or false to indicate that we no longer have an empty box, we now have a full box? It's an easy question. You guys know the answer. You're just tired, right? The level sensor? Level sensor. So level equal one. When level sensor goes true, then we need to go here to the full box. And so far, this is nothing more than a sequence, right? We're just going from state to state to state, or step to step to step. And so far, a state machine really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, after 
we've got this full box. How do we know that it's time to get a box again? How do we know that, oh, well, the full box is off the conveyor, and it's time to go to back to the get box state? Well, the problem is if you look at the simulator, you actually don't know when the, the box leaves the end of the conveyor. There's no sensor there. And here's where a lot of students will mess up in programming. They'll think, well, I know how fast the conveyor moves. I can measure time with a timer. Couldn't I, after I've got a full box and the motor turns on, couldn't I set a timer and say, after a certain period of time, now let's go out of the full box state, or we could be sure that the box is cleared. That's a bad idea. Let me explain why. It's a bad idea because there's no guarantee that that conveyor is going to work all the time. What happens when the motor stops working? What happens when the conveyor belt breaks? Right? The PLC doesn't know what's going on. Or, or sometimes the amount of time required, say the, the motor's just running at a slow speed today for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe there's a bearing that's rubbing, or maybe the motor is weak today, or well, for whatever reason. We cannot guarantee that the event has occurred after a certain amount of time. Students try to use timers in place of sensors, and that's a bad practice. Even A lot of people even do this in industry, which is bad practice. What you really want is a sensor at the end of the conveyor, or you need to just accept what you have and admit you don't know that there's a full box leaving the conveyor after the PROX sensor goes off. Does that make sense? When the PROX sensor turns off, I'm sorry, turned off, goes to zero. That's when I want to say, okay, there's, there may be a full box on the end of the conveyor. I don't know, I have nothing to sense it. As far as I'm concerned, that full box is gone, and now I'm trying to get a box. And that'll work just fine, right? Because if there's a full box on the end of the conveyor that's still moving off, and I go to the get box state, that'll keep the motor on, that box will keep going off the conveyor, and a new box will come on, and everything will be okay. Now, a, another thing to note, do I really need this level equals zero? You see, see, it's possible for the PLC to move from state to state very rapidly if it wants to. In fact, you should always think about your PLC programming operating much, much faster than the mechanical system operates. You know how there's the little hourglass thing? I guess there used to be. I think maybe they removed it from Windows. I haven't seen it for a while now. That I think about it. Remember the hourglass thing that would rotate? Some people would change it. Did you ever customize your mouse pointer? And you could have the hands tapping instead, waiting for something to happen? Okay. Well, that's what the PLC is doing most of the time. It's sitting there waiting. Okay, mechanical system. When is this box going to finally come into place so that I can fill it? Okay, so it's spending a lot of time just waiting in this state, trying to determine when there's a full box, okay? or a box to fill, I'm sorry. So let's go back to our consideration of whether we need prox and level. We definitely need prox because prox tells us there's a box in place. But what if that box was full? What if we had level equal to one? Well, in this case, if this is one of our conditions for transitions, we would not transition. We would stay in the get box state, which would be appropriate. That would keep that box moving through the system. We wouldn't attempt to fill it, and we'd need to get an empty box. But if we do not include that condition, then what will happen? Let's say that a full box comes into position. We will go to the fill box state. We'll turn the motor off, or at least we'll send a command to turn the motor off and a command to turn the valve on. But remember, the PLC is going to set these outputs very rapidly. Those outputs are going to take time to respond. The motor is not going to come on immediately, okay? Or, I'm sorry, shut off immediately. The valve is not going to come on immediately. It's going to take some time. And what will happen is we'll be in this state for one scan and realize, oh, level's already on. Because remember, the, the scenario is we've got a full box coming in under the, the, the hopper. Level is on, and we will immediately next scan go to this. So we'll spend 20 milliseconds, maybe, in this state. That's not enough time for these outputs to ever change. To you and me, watching the mechanical system, it would look like the motor just stayed on, because the PLC will go through so quickly through the fill box state, since level is true, that we'll get to the full box state and go back. Well, once we clear it, right, then we'll go back to the get box state. Does that make sense? So by designing this carefully, we don't have to include level equals zero here as a condition for transitioning, which will make our lives easier later on. Like I said, the fewer conditions you can have for inputs on the transitions, the better off you'll be, the, the easier it will be to program. So here's what you need to, if you're making notes, here's what you need to remember. States are associated with outputs. That's where you choose what the outputs are set to. 
Transitions are all about inputs. It's the inputs that determine whether or not the transitions between states occur. It's the states that determine what outputs are set or reset. Okay? Now, this is not everything, because so far, we've got a three-step sequence. This is pretty boring. We could do this with bits and not bother with state machines. So let me, uh, let me add in one thing. This is sort of a, um, I guess I'm kind of forcing state machines into this example. I should come up with a better example. I just don't have one. So let me add one thing in. Let me add in a stop state. Now the stop state will have motor, off, and valve off. So this would be the state where the machine's just not running. Now what would it be? Is there a way I could go to this state from each? Well, actually I could. I can draw a transition from each of the states to this stop state and just decide what input it is that transitions me from, say, get box, for example, to stop, or from fill box to stop. In fact, it's pretty simple. It would be the stop button, right? That's the, the input that I would want to transition me from any state to the stop state. So when the stop button is pressed, the stop button by default is a normally closed thing, right? So it's normally passing power. So normally its input has a one in it. Does that make sense? When you press the stop button, what happens? Zero. You get a zero, right? So stop equals zero indicates that the stop button is active. Does that make sense? So my condition for transition on all of these is simply stop equals zero. And now I have something that a, sequence, uh, a sequencing machine cannot do. A sequencing machine cannot go from any step to any other step arbitrarily like this. The default setup is just to stay here and fill boxes all day long. But any one of these states can be essentially interrupted by pressing the stop button to go to the stop state. Now notice, so far, I've drawn all arrows into the state and nothing out. If we go to this state, we're stuck, right? If I design the program that way, as soon as the user presses the stop button, boom, program's dead. It's going to stay right here. So I need some way to get out of this. Now, what do you think I should do? What state should I go to? Let's say we're in the stop state and the user presses the start button. That would probably be our transition out, right? Start equal one, but where should we go? Should we go to get box, fill box, or full box? What do you think? I would say get box, right? That's probably what the user <coughs> is, is going to expect, is that the machine's ready to accept an empty box and fill it, okay? So now we have our uh, state machine, and we've got almost all of the transitions. You see, the way the PLC program is going to work is the PLC is going to evaluate on every scan which state it should be in. Uh, do you understand that the PLC is scanning the ladder logic at a, 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 not a frequency, but a period of about 20 milliseconds? Uh, with a program like this, it'll be even less, probably 10, maybe 5 milliseconds or so. So it's scanning the ladder logic over and over and over. It's evaluating, say it's in the get box state, it's going to evaluate over and over and over what state should I be in. It's kind of like the PLC is nervous or anxious, <laughs> okay? It's always wondering what state it should be in. So if it's in the get box state, we don't want it to necessarily transition out. We might want it to stay in that. So there's a, what I call a null transition. In other words, if you're in the state, you have the option of going back into the state. So the scan, the logic, may calculate stay in this state. But it has to calculate every scan which state it's going to go to. So each of these will have what I will call a null transition. Null means nothing, essentially. So a null transition so that the PLC can stay in its current state. Now we need these transitions so we don't forget to program them. So I've added them to the, the diagram. Now the diagram that I've got on Blackboard is equivalent to this. It's not exactly this diagram. It's from last semester, but I really didn't want to take another picture and upload it and all that mess. Okay. Any questions so far? This is the way we're going to program. We're going, if, if we use state machine design, we'll decide what states we want, decide what the transitions are to move from state to state so that the machine works the way we want it to work, and then we'll take this and convert it into a program. So this we're literally going to convert into a program, and I'll show you how to do that. 
It's a long process, but if you do it right and you don't make any mistakes along the way, you'll have a program that will do exactly what you've drawn, which is kind of nice because you don't have to think about how to put everything together to make the PLC operate the machine properly. Questions, comments? Okay, I'm going to pause the video so I can move it.